Before we get into the episode with Patrick Harvey, I'd like to tell you about the new album from The Paper Sparrows. And their new album, Hiding Away From The Light, is released on the 24th of June. In your life you thought you had it made It features tracks like Saving Grace Tears Like Silver What I'd give for one more day One last reprieve before I lay No price you name I wouldn't pay What I'd give for one more day And Whispering to the Waves Whispering to the Waves You can get this album at papersparrowsmusic.com You can also stream it on Bandcamp, Spotify or Apple Music or you can buy the album on vinyl, CD and digitally. panic when I was driving through and uh, the sat nav says you're about to enter the low emission zone, <laughs> check your permit and I was like whoa <laughs> what's going on here <laughs> so I had to make a couple of phone calls but it was just a case of putting in my registration and it said you're fine to drive yeah. <laughs> so it's worked out alright. Well folk are getting used to that but yeah I mean I, we'll, we'll maybe talk about it under if, if we're talking about climate, but you know, it's it's one of these examples where a lot of the easy stuff has been done, and if we're going to stay on track with climate targets, it means doing stuff that people will push back against, and mm. people will be finding more difficult. It's going to be challenges for the years ahead. Yeah. Patrick Harvey, how are you doing? I'm pretty well. I'm overheated because it's the hottest day of the year <laughs> so far, but me and the rest of Glasgow are sweltering in it. It's quite warm, eh? It is. I'm from Burnt Island in, in Fife. It was quite foggy, like har, mm. and it was so clammy. And I was speaking to a colleague who is from Manchester, and I said, do you know the word clammy? She was like, oh, that's a word for us as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I've learnt something already today. Yeah. Today's episode... Patrick Harvey, MSP, does that sound weird or is that something that you have just been, got used to and you had been striving for this for a long, long time? Yeah, I mean, I think it felt weird at first. You know, I've been in the Scottish Parliament for a, a while now, just past 20 years, in 20 fact, years. which is kind of hard to believe. And in my head, I'm still the kind of fresh-faced 30-year-old <laughs> that, that got elected, you know. But yeah, I think it probably took me and, and some of my colleagues who were freshly elected then maybe the best part of a year to really get used to it and to get into the rhythm of it. It's a job that does take a, a while to get your feet properly under the desk and know what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's going back a while. <laughs> <laughs> so you said 20, 20 years? Yeah, just just gone 20 years. Yeah. 2003, was it? That's right. What was, what was happening in the world in 2003? Well, you know, we were f- fresh in the, the wake of the uh, the Iraq uh, invasion. Right. You know, there'd been all these massive anti-war marches and rallies in Glasgow and so many other places around the world. Yeah, in fact, a few months before I was elected, uh, I was speaking for the party at the big anti-war demo where they were estimating 100,000 people in Glasgow. Uh, I'm not sure they could all hear the the sound system at the at the rally, but uh, yeah, it was it was quite a moment. But also in that first session of the Scottish Parliament, one of the big issues that had dominated was the repeal of Section 28, also known as Section 2A, homophobic hangover of the Thatcher government, and it was it was hugely controversial. You know, you had you know sections of the the right wing press, religious hierarchies, and Scotland's richest businessmen as he was at the time, throwing their lot in together and trying to figure out 
can we be the religious right in Scotland? In this new political landscape, how much influence have we got if we form a religious right block? I was an LGBT youth worker in that in those years, and it was a really, really stressful, kind of hellish time actually. You know, I was going to walk, uh, going to walk, work, walking past billboards saying "Protect our children," which meant from me, you know, yeah. and that. Especially as a youth worker, that feels pretty personal. And for, for young people I know that were coming to our, our group for support and services, and in, in the daytime they were at school, and phrases like keep the claws were being used as a, as a bullying taunt in, in playgrounds, you know? Yeah, for me, it was, it was about trying to make sure that we were contributing to, to the parliament that would continue to do the right thing mm -hmm. on LGBT plus people's equality and, and not take that that difficult Section 28 campaign uh, almost as a, as a last word on the issue, because there were, there were certainly people who've, in other parties who felt that their fingers had been burnt by it and they didn't want to go near those issues again. In fact, I remember, I think it might have been the day that we were getting sworn into Parliament uh, back in 2003, and my mum and dad were there to sit in the gallery watching and everything. And uh, I went for a pint with my dad afterwards, and there was a journalist that he happened to know, because he used to work at the BBC, and he came over and we were having a, a drink together. And he gave me this piece of advice, and I genuinely think he was well-meaning. I, I genuinely think he, he thought this was good, useful, helpful advice. Uh, he just said, don't go near those issues yourself either, because people will just think you're the gay one, and that's kind of the end of who you are. Right. Um, and I, you know, I understand why he thought, from my point of view, I wouldn't want to be pigeonholed or, or kind of stereotyped in that way. But I don't think anyone would say to a newly elected black MP, don't say anything about racism. Mm. Uh, or to a, a, a woman MSP, don't say anything about the gender pay gap. I just don't think that kind of advice would, would be offered. And uh, so, yeah, I, I rejected it <laughs> politely. <laughs> That's a very long way of as answering your question. <laughs> So let's go back right to the beginning. Uh -huh. Patrick Harvey, where did it all begin for you? I grew up in Dumbarton, didn't move around as a kid, I was there for 18 years. And, uh, my mum was a, a midwife, worked the night shift mostly, so she'd be sleeping during the daytime when we got home from school and uh, probably get annoyed when we put the telly on back from school <laughs> and she would wake up and then she'd be off out to work uh, at night. My dad, as I said earlier, worked at the BBC, he was a film editor. Okay. Highlight occasionally, once or twice a year, was there'd be a, a, a drama would come on and his name would be in the credits <laughs> at the end and we'd all have to gather around and watch his name go up the screen, you know. Yeah, and my mum was obviously also very politically active. I mean, it was a, it was the kind of household where, you know, you watched the news uh, uh, just as a default and mm. there was political kind of awareness. But my mum was also involved in CND a, a wee bit, more particularly environmental activism. She set up a, a local recycling charity. Recycling in, in this country, the, there was a long period of time when councils did, did none of it. It just didn't happen. Yeah. And it was community leadership and community activism that actually started making that happen. So like a, a few other places, my mum and some friends set up a, a charity with a borrowed van and collecting newspapers really? uh, from outside people's doors. And uh, there was a, a shed that we'd got access to on the on the pier at Helensborough. Uh, we'd got this access to the shed to store all the newspapers. So some Saturdays I'd be out on the back of a van throwing bundles of newspapers about. And, Very good. Um, um, so your mum was a big inspiration for you being an activist. Your dad, was he politically aware and he just couldn't because he worked for the BBC or was <laughs> what was what was the script with your dad? Uh, no, I mean, he was certainly politically aware and politically interested. I mean, I, I suspect it was, you know, having a, a kind of very full-time job that probably he maybe didn't have the time or the energy for, uh, for activism and campaigning. Hmm. Uh, he does enjoy telling uh, and retelling and retelling this, this story <laughs> about uh, back in the days when every BBC building had somebody who worked in an office and nobody knew if they did an actual real job and everybody thought they were working for the secret services <laughs> and my dad tells with with relish the time that uh, this fella had been overheard describing him as a dangerous red so, <laughs> <laughs> which might be slightly over egging it but you know <laughs> but no i mean there was there was always a kind of awareness of a, a lot of awareness of environmental politics through through my mum's campaigning but also UK political stuff. I think I, I think my earliest political memory is probably of seeing Margaret Thatcher walk into 10 Downing Street for the first time when she got elected. Mm. Uh, and I, as far as I remember it, that 
your memory's always a bit hazy at this far back, but as far as I remember, I, I looked up at my mum and said, Mummy, is that a nice lady? And she said, no, that's not a nice lady at all. We don't like her. So. <laughs> the brain motion started at a very young age. Yeah, quite right. But she was right. <laughs> she, was, she, was, she was absolutely right. a few rallies with your mum didn't you I mean I think I, I certainly remember getting pushed along in a pram on a, a CND march yeah um, what was CND for people that uh, yeah campaign for nuclear disarmament so um, being aware that that nuclear weapons were based so close to us yeah to where we were growing up and um, my mum was occasionally close to, to folk who were uh, living at the peace camp at Faz Lane mm. uh, when that was getting started there was a, a fair amount of kind of anti-nuclear stuff around the time but I mean you know even more recently like I remember just um, just before the lockdown just literally weeks I think before before Covid changed everything here uh, I'd been invited to speak at uh, you know the Fridays for Future the school climate strikers yes. uh, were having a, a rally in George Square and they'd asked me to go along and say a few words and my mum happened to be in town that day uh, and so she was there as well and she said something as well so y- you had these three generations of angry, impatient kind of climate <laughs> activists. And I was making the point, if the world had listened when those alarm bells were getting rung by my mum's generation, back in the 70s, 80s, even in the 60s, the, the science was beginning to emerge and it was getting covered up by the fossil fuel industry. And then, you know, they generated this kind of climate denial conspiracy movement. If the world had listened when the science was starting to, to show that, you know, this was a serious problem and we needed to change our ways, the changes that we have to make could have been done so much more easily and slowly and probably cheaply as well. You know, mm. it, the, the only reason that there were, a, what people use the phrase climate emergency now, is that the world didn't listen yeah. and didn't start making those changes at the, at the sensible time. I was in uh, Copenhagen recently to look at what they're doing on heat networks. And that's a, an example of a country that did take, not necessarily climate science, but the energy crisis in the 1970s. They very deliberately say, OK, we, we don't want to leave people dependent uh, on, on a, something as volatile as this. Mm. And they started massively uh, investing in heat networks with a law that said those networks have to be run not for profit. They have to be run in the public interest. As a result of that, you know, they've now got you know, heat networks that are still a bit of a mystery to most people in this country. Very few people know anyone who's, who's on a heat network. But they're extremely efficient. They're, uh, you know, they're great, even, even if, um, uh, in terms of the winter, if, uh, if, you, if you see some roads in Denmark, they don't ice up because there's just a little bit of residual heat comes from the network under the road, yeah. and so the road stays, stays usable. You know, people's homes are, are cosy and warm and affordable. And now they find it so much easier to swap out the heat source on a network for a low carbon one. So decarbonizing uh, our buildings is going to be a huge challenge in this country because we're all, almost all, using individual gas boilers. So each of those individual heat systems has to change. Whereas in Denmark, you can just swap out a, a gas generator feeding your heat network. You can swap that out and, and put a, a low carbon system in place and you decarbonize your whole community in one go. Yeah. So yeah, they were sensible, and, and this country wasn't. The country carried on, you know, taking the, not just the oil and gas out of the ground and burning it, and mm-hmm. that contributes to, to, the, to the crisis, but taking the money out of that industry and just letting it go off into the market for whatever the market wants to use that money for. Yeah. And we could have been investing in transforming our economy at that point. So the, the reason that this is all so difficult and needs to be done so fast and doing it fairly at that pace is incredibly difficult uh, is because it should have been started decades ago. Why does it always seem last minute? We were warned about COVID years before there was a pandemic coming. Mm. Nothing was put in place. We were warned about climate change. Mm -hmm. We were warned about energy crisis, gas shortages. Everything just seems like a last minute scramble. Mm. Why is that? It's a really good question, um, and I don't even think it's just politics. I think it's it's often human nature. Plenty of people would reflect personally about a warning about doing more exercise or eating more healthily or drinking a bit less or giving up smoking, and quite often we only change 
the behaviours that we're very, very attached to when we absolutely have to. I was always kind of the kind of kid that would leave my homework until the last minute. Uh, you know, most people can recognise that or mm -hmm. meeting, a, meeting a deadline at the last minute. There's, there is something about human nature that likes to defer the hard work That's or right. investing now in order to get something better in the future. You know, that kind of delayed gratification thing. And politics is, politics has the additional challenge that very often the person who's making the decision today won't be the MP, the councillor, the council leader, the minister in five years' time or in ten years' time. Yeah. Uh, the electoral cycle, you know, it's not just an election every five years at each level, but there's always another election coming around the corner. So that sense of wanting to offer people a quick and easy solution. Did I see that the Highland Council were investing in their own energy network? Is that right? Quite, quite a few councils are setting up their own energy companies. Mm. Um, they will... They will do different things based on what's what's the challenge and the resource in a local area. So, in some places, I think local locally publicly owned energy companies could be just being generators, just installing whether it's onshore wind, whether it's solar, uh, whatever the technology is, just being the operator that that generates energy. In some places, it'll be about the technology that's needed to balance supply against demand. So. How do we make sure that, uh, for example, when housing developments are going in, you're not just generating way more extra uh, demand on the, the local grid mm. than, than you can cope with? Because if, if you do that, then you simply won't get permission to connect to the grid. But if you can, if you can do that in a way that uses some, some public leadership to bring in things like battery storage, things like local uh, renewable generation within that so that you're not just creating more demand on the grid but you're generating energy where it's needed uh, and storing it as well uh, and in some places it will principally be about the built environment it'll be about how do we retrofit you know buildings like the one that we're, we're sat in at the moment where my office is based this is an old building it's been repurposed it would have had a, an industrial use uh, a long time ago it's now uh, got offices it's got a range of different users but it's not the you know, gold standard in terms of energy efficiency, mm -hmm. not, not by quite a long way. How do we retrofit those buildings? How do we, right now, there's an awareness that Glasgow City Centre has got more retail space than it needs. Some of that's changes that were happening before COVID yeah. around online retail. It's been accelerated by COVID. The way we use city centres is changing faster than it was expected. So we've got buildings that, that were put up for retail and we've got more retail space than we need. How do we repurpose those buildings for residential use, more people living in the cities, uh, for other, other types of, of use that can contribute to a sustainable economy? But that means, that means they're going to have to meet new standards. They're going to have to be, be brought up to spec in terms of their energy performance. Yeah. Local leadership and local public uh, energy companies can play a really critical role so yeah, there's going to be there's going to be a wide range of ways of doing this, not just a one size fits all, and it will depend on you know each each local area thinking what's our challenge here, what are our priorities, and what are the resources that we've got. He says you left Dumbartonshire. Dumbartonshire. Yeah. Dumbarton, yeah. Uh, you left Dumbarton at 18. Yeah, went down to Manchester for uni. What was what was the reasoning behind that? Okay, at that point I knew I wanted to get away, like a lot of a lot of young people do. I wanted to get out of the family home and you know have my own life. I mean, I had just come out not long before that. I didn't know much about the the various kind of places that I was applying to for for uni. And I remember phoning up the helpline called the Lesbian and Gay Switchboard. Been going for for donkey's years. Uh, I remember phoning them up. Uh, I think I've waited till the middle of the night and everybody in, in the house had gone to bed and I phoned <laughs> them up and uh, I just wanted to know about these, these places that I'd got offers from and I'd had an offer from Warwick and they, they looked up their, their kind of database or their mm -hmm. uh, lists or whatever said yeah yeah there's a couple of places a couple of kind of gay venues or organisations or whatever didn't sound very enthusiastic and I said uh, the other one I've got is Manchester oh go to Manchester go to Manchester he said <laughs> Manchester's fantastic you'll love it Very <laughs> so, good so yeah, that was <laughs> that was my career's advice. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you study down there? Lots of things, badly. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll be honest. I was, I was pretty miserable at school. Probably, you know, not unconnected to to not having been out. And it, it is genuinely amazing to think that there are schools now, including my old school, that have got LGBT plus support groups and you know mm. stuff actually happening in school. It would have been literally inconceivable growing up queer in the west of Scotland in the 1980s it just it wouldn't have been possible to hold that thought in your head that that could happen one day so yeah I, I wasn't I, you know I wasn't in a good place when I was at school went to went to uni and the most important thing I learned from being at university was how to be a human being I think and how mm. to you know have friends and a social life and to yeah and so that probably was the major part of my education and the academic side suffered a bit from, yeah, right. from that so yeah, I jumped courses a lot and I started lots of things and didn't finish them. And so I was a bad student, but I was a better person by the end of it, I think. Very good. Very good. You're talking about there about LGBTQ mm-hmm. and you must look at what's what's available for young people and just individuals now. Yeah. The 18-year-old Patrick Harvey, he says there, your mind probably would have been blown mm. looking at 2023. Yeah. Still got a long way to go. Yeah. I mean, I've got very mixed feelings when I think about where we've got to because, yeah, you're right, there is there is far more available, not just in terms of support services and, and places to go, even something as simple as, as putting up a poster in, in a school or in a, a GP surgery or a community centre that makes it clear it's okay to be who you are. But, you know, the, the media as well it has has so much more diversity uh, not everywhere. You maybe have to go looking for it in places, but so there's there's all of that that positive stuff, and obviously legal changes that that have been made successively over over decades. But at the same time, the extent to which social media, in particular, has allowed every worst element of human nature to be amplified. Uh, and you know, we're all carrying around these these devices. I've got my phone here, little black oblong that, you know, if you describe this and what it's capable of, let's say kind of 12, 13 year old me reading sci-fi stories and, uh, you know, if you describe this, this would have been amazing. I mean, you've got a little black rectangle in your pocket that can connect you to anyone else in the blink of an eye. The tap of a screen, you can access the sum total of human knowledge. Everyone can broadcast as well as receive. This should be incredibly liberating, and yet it now is the thing that people carry around their abuse that's Mm. being directed at them. Mm. You know, it's not just something that you encounter in particular places, whether it's a school playground or the walk home or whatever. It's in your pocket, it's in front of you, it's in the device that does keep you connected to the rest of the world. Mm. The device that keeps you connected to your friends when you can't see them is the device through which all of this abuse comes. So yeah, there's so much progress that's been made, and yet I can you know bring Twitter up on this this phone, and I wouldn't say it's 100% certain, but most days if I do that, I'll be spending five minutes blocking people who are calling me a deviant, a pervert, a paedophile, mm. you know, and and worse, you know, direct threats. And young people are being faced with that as well. Young people are growing up with that bully in their pocket. So it's it's very mixed feelings, and the. The way that some of this is being weaponized by kind of populist politicians and the whole war on woke bullshit, uh, you know, is is really frightening. Uh, how successful that they're being at doing that. One thing that I've noticed is I'm left wing. Some would say I'm a socialist. Some Not of a the dirty word. <laughs> <laughs> I'll scroll through. And it doesn't matter how many times I'll say, do not recommend a right wing mm. narrative. Mm-hmm. I am still fed right wing. Yeah media yeah and very little left wing comes through in that device yeah why do you think that is uh well the algorithm might know us but it it knows its its owner's preferences as well um (laughs) i i think sometimes it's it's also just sometimes it's just a question of of what works of what generates click and what generates reaction and anger and hostility generate more reaction outrage is is a great seller there's a reason why the Daily Mail doesn't put empathy on its front pages because it knows that it doesn't generate that kind of reaction. Um, so there's there's a kind of there's an extent to which it's it's just kind of feeding the beast regardless of of the the moral worth of the content. Mm. So it's not necessarily all kind of 
out of somebody's badness. There's not a kind of moustache twirling villain behind it all. Mm. But again, some like I was saying about politics, some of some of why politics is is deeply flawed as a process uh, is not because of politicians being bad people. Some of it's because of human nature, whether the politicians or the voters or the journalists. Mm. Some of it is just human nature playing out on a bigger scale. And I think there's an extent to which that's happening on social media as well. And the worst excesses of, of bullying behaviour that you might see in your school, you might see in your workplace, you might see in your community, just get amplified in, in, that, in that space. Hmm. Yeah, let's, let's be conscious of it and let's, let's try to look after each other through it. Uh, and as, as this new wave of, kind of AI content, again, is going to be another way that people do amazing creative things, but also another way that people manipulate each other and manipulate information. You know, as all of this continues to change, let's just try to uh, to see that there are some positives in there and see how we can expand those and be aware of what the negatives might be and, and see if we can look after each other through yeah. that. You talked about AI there. How would you regulate it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... It, I genuinely don't know if it's possible because, you know, this is not... It's not like an industry where you can you can see where the emissions are coming from. You can measure that and monitor it and control it. It's so much more decentralised than that. It's it's so much more uh, all pervading, uh, and it's going to end up having effects that you can't necessarily identify. You 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 won't look at particular media content and say, okay, there there's the measurable effect of, of an AI having decided what it's going to generate or who it's, who it's going to push that at or who's seeing what. I had an interview uh, with someone who'd used uh, an AI system to, to start generating new drugs and it had reached uh, conclusions that would not have been reachable in any other way and had come up with these amazing uh, new drugs that were going to have incredible potential for positive. And the interviewer said, if somebody wanted to use the same system to generate new bioweapons, how would, how would we stop that happening? And the researcher was like, oh, um, well, yeah. we, we didn't. We didn't do that. So that, that yeah. was kind of almost the only answer. So I don't know if it's possible to, to regulate. Maybe we need to ask the AI, how, how do we regulate? <laughs> I suppose us asking the question, how do we regulate AI right now, means it's probably too late to regulate it. It's already been created. Mm. It's probably already went too far. Militaries will get a hold of it. Yeah. If there's anything that history has told us is that we will make an arse of it. Yeah. I, I, Imagine I, what's going to happen at the next US presidential election with the, the kind of media manipulation that's going to be possible. Yeah. Uh, with all this kind of image generation and. That's that was my next thing was. It can create voices. I could create the Patrick Harvey voice yeah. on AI. Yeah. I, I, you could I, put a Douglas Ross speech into my <laughs> mouth and you would see my face yeah. saying this. Or yeah. I could generate an image of you stealing a Mars bar from the local shop. Who is to say that that's not real? You know what I mean? Then, yeah. you, then you've got to go and prove, prove yeah. that you didn't say that. You did, That wasn't you. Mm -hmm. It's a scary time. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So Patrick, when I announced that you were going to be the next guest on the podcast, I asked the listeners to submit some questions to put to you. And I've called this feature, Let's Get Political. Let's get political, political. Let's get political, political. <coughs> right, Keith has asked... Do you support multi-party one-ticket vote at the next election for independence? Uh, that's not where, where we would go as a party, no. Um, you know at, a, at an election, I think people do have a, you know, a right to vote on the issues that concern them most. For some people, independence is the only issue that concerns them. I don't think that's most people. Whether on, on the yes or the no side, I think there's, there's a small number of people who, who only really I think that's the, the one single issue they want to vote on. Most people, it's a much wider range of, of issues 
uh, that that determine how they're going to vote. And so, yeah, I think people ought to have a, a, a range of choices about candidates. How would you achieve independence? How would you go about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the big issue at the moment. I mean, very clearly we need to continue to assert that Scotland does have the right to, to put this question to the voters. We've election after election after election, we've seen uh, majorities uh, elected uh, in both parliaments on the basis that the people should have the right to, to put that question again. So we need to, to not give up on, on making that basic democratic case. The current UK government clearly have no willingness to, to respect that democratic principle. Current UK government are also clearly coming to the end of their tenure, yep. not before time. Uh, and I think one of the things that is going to be interesting, what would an incoming Labour government be like in terms of, of that relationship with the Scottish Parliament? Will they continue to use the Internal Market Act to interfere in devolved issues? Will they reverse the Section 35 order that prevents devolved legislation from becoming law? Will they have the, the respectful relationship between the parliaments and the governments uh, that they uh, said they wanted when they, when they campaigned for and, and, and created a Scottish Parliament in the first place? Or will they continue that hostile, toxic attitude uh, that you see from the current UK government. You know, if they continue to do that because they, they share the strategic objective of not wanting people to trust the current Scottish government, if they continue to interfere in a way that, that pursues that same strategy, you know, I, I think people will lose trust not just in a Tory government, but in a Westminster government, regardless of which party it is. Uh, and I think they will they will very quickly recognise that people will, will simply not tolerate that. And if they depart from that strategy and they go toward one that's more respectful, then they're going to have to accept that when people vote time after time after time after time for majorities that, that want to say you have a right to a referendum to make this decision, they're going to have to respect that. A anything else is going to continue to, to undermine and erode any sense of, of the, the Westminster institutions. So you left uni? Yeah. Knowing what you were wanting to do after that? No, quite the reverse. I was a bit of a, a, bit, a bit of a mess and um, okay. uh, yeah, came back here slightly kind of tail between my legs and um, two days after I moved back into my parents' place with the intention of then getting a flat in Glasgow, yeah. it was minus 20. It was, it was the worst winter I can remember. Right. Uh, and all of the transport, all the trains and buses and stuff into Glasgow were off. And I was sat there thinking, what have I done? <laughs> Why have I come back here? <laughs> so yeah, I was a wee bit miserable then. Ended up volunteering for the LGBT youth group uh, that I had previously come out to when I was 18. Mm -hmm. Kind of went back there to see if there was any of the, the folk that I'd remembered from before uni still about, really just as a kind of starting point to make some friends in Glasgow again. Uh, ended up volunteering and then there was an organisation called Face West, P-H-A-C-E, it's the project for HIV and AIDS care and education. So they had a, a gay men's team that was doing uh, health promotion work in the uh, gay and bisexual men's community. And they had a, a little bit of underspend one financial year and they came to me and said, do you want to do you want to do a piece of work with the youth group and see if we can develop some proposals for what it needs going forward? And so I, I quit the temping job that I had and I, I, I did that and it... You know, like a lot of things in the voluntary sector, you know, short-term grant leads on to short-term grant, yep. leads on to kind of stumbling away to, and it eventually it became a, a full-time job. It's, it's remarkable to, to think back that you, you just had that kind of group of young people, not even left to their own devices, nobody even kind of even acknowledged they were there, really, and just setting up a, a youth group because somebody had to and they were there. Yeah. And uh, the kind of... The kind of weird cloak and dagger thing, where if you if you phoned up the the, the, the switchboard, you, this, this helpline I mentioned earlier, and you wanted to find out how to go to the youth group, uh, the instruction you were given was to go to the to the GFT, you know, the Glasgow Film Theatre on on Rose Street, at a particular time. I think it was seven o'clock on a Tuesday night, and you look for the person holding a blue folder. That was the the secret signal, right? <laughs> and you saw the person holding the blue folder, and and they would be kind of. It's what you would call a befriending service, I, I guess, but it was all on this completely amateur, just community mm. basis. It wasn't an organisation providing this. Mm. Yeah, it, it, the, the need was clearly there for a long time. And I'm sure there were people who would have fallen through the cracks in the absence of a, 
that more developed service that exists now, mm -hmm. uh, people who would have been harmed seriously uh, or would have harmed themselves because of the absence of that support network or they didn't know where to reach it. Mm. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing to see that that exists in far more communities, not just the cities as well. In many rural areas and small towns have got that kind of support service in place as well. <coughs> Let's get political, political. Let's get political, political. <clears throat> Has the momentum from COP26 gone? Because I felt COP26, before that as well, people were taking the climate emergency serious. Let's make change. Let's make radical change right now. And using the deposit return scheme, which is actually a very, very simple yeah. scheme yeah. has met some resistance. That must be really frustrating. Absolutely. I mean, I think the point that we're at now is all political parties in the Scottish Parliament have voted for very ambitious targets. That's the easy bit, voting to, to agree the targets where you want to get to. The government knows, and this would be regardless of which party was in government. It's us and the SNP happen to be in government at the moment. If it was any other party or parties, they'd be faced with the same thing. They, there's a legal obligation to come forward with a climate plan that can, doesn't come with a guarantee, but it's capable of meeting those targets. And the current plan isn't good enough, and so the new plan is due out by the end of this year. So we have an obligation to come out with that plan that involves new policies, new programmes, uh, that will have a, 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 at least a viable path toward uh, those climate targets. And it is going to involve things which uh, will be easily attacked by people who want to be opportunistic. Uh, if you look at, talked about the deposit return scheme and, and some of the, the kind of sabotage against that, same thing with the reaction against low emission zones in Glasgow. Worse still down south where you have things like low traffic neighbourhoods, ultra low emission zone, uh, 15 minute or 20 minute neighbourhoods, that, that notion of be people being able to reach the things that they need close at hand. Uh, so that people don't feel locked into a kind of high travel dependency. And this kind of stuff gets woven by bad faith actors into some kind of conspiracy theory, as though you know, it, it's part of the kind of culture warsy type mentality. And you know, if, if we're going to make the changes that we have to make to, to reduce emissions and to do it fairly, it is going to have to involve changes that are politically more difficult difficult to communicate but also easy to attack uh, and easy to polarize mm -hmm. so that's one of the worries that i think uh, anybody working on climate policy at the moment should have is how do we maintain that sense of of collective decision making about the targets into how do we reach those targets i mean i remember when we debated the first climate act um way back in 2008-9 and at that point, the target was an 80% reduction by 2050. And I was saying how pleased I was that we'd got consensus that we need to, to have ambitious targets. But I, I was expressing the view that nobody, myself included, can really draw a picture of what uh, Scotland looks like in 2050 with 80% reduction in emissions. What, what kind of Scotland is that? What are the changes that, that will get us there? I don't think anybody knew. And it would kind of been silly to, to imagine that you could. It would be like asking politicians in the 1960s to describe Scotland of, of the year 2010. Yeah. You know, it, you, it's just not a realistic expectation that you can, that you can have that level of foresight uh, about how society is going to change, how technology is going to change, how the economy is going to change, demographics, all the rest of it. Add into that, that we, we also know that the impact on the climate itself and the, the uh, natural environment, that, that harm, that damage is happening at a, a far faster and more damaging rate than, than we'd even predicted a few years ago. Yeah. So those impacts on water supply, uh, you know, a modern sophisticated uh, economy relies on supply chains that are global. Uh, and that's going to impact, I mean, even, even just coming back to that issue about decarbonizing our homes, that in itself depends on uh, materials, uh, on machinery. Uh, some of it can be manufactured in Glasgow, but it's still being 
you know, using supply chains for, for the materials that are global. And everybody's doing that at the same time around the world. So those supply chains are already under pressure. When you start to see climate impacts affecting those supply chains as well, the, the worst thing that we could do, though, is to decide that it's all too complicated or that it's all too late, because that would lead to inaction as well. And, you know, for, for the first couple of decades since climate science was, was telling us the alarm bells are needing to be rung, the information was covered up by the fossil fuel industry. The next couple of decades, it was conspiracy and denial and, you know, all this disinformation. And then you've had a, a decade or two now where instead of denying the problem, they're trying to slow down the solution. They're trying to do climate delay, not climate denial. And say, yes, we need a transition, but you must do it slowly. You must give us more time to do it. So delay is, is the current enemy. What we mustn't do is give in to defeatism, though, because whether it's the cover-up, whether it's denial, delay or defeatism, all of these would be re reasons for inaction. And uh, so we, we can't afford to, to just decide it's all too late. What we have to do is focus on the positive opportunities that we've got to make change as fast as we can. And it is one of the big challenges. It is going to be maintaining that sense of, of political agreement across the spectrum and a, a social buy-in, a sense of social buy-in from the public. Probably the, the, the easiest thing that we could do right now, uh, or at the moment at Westminster could do, I'd love it if we had the power here in Scotland, decouple the gas and electricity prices. Scotland is generating large amounts of cheap, abundant, clean, green, renewable electricity. And we're not passing that price benefit on to families, to businesses, to organisations of any kind. They're still paying for electricity uh, a price that is artificially linked to gas, to fossil fuel. Um, it's crazy. And if we broke that link, they keep saying they're going to, but they never quite say when they're going to do it or how they're going to do it. If we broke that link, we could be making that switch to renewables not just something that people can afford, but actually people find hugely attractive and beneficial and free up some of their money for other priorities. Yes. When does your political ambitions kind of start to gain traction? So, I mean, during that first session of the Scottish Parliament, when the, the repeal of Section 28 was such a, a big deal, I mean, it was, it was big in terms of politics, but it was big in terms of our community and the impact on me personally. So we had the parliamentary campaign to, to try and convince MSPs to, to vote for repeal and, you know, to fight against those who, those who were trying to make too much of a compromise of saying, yes, we'll repeal it, but we'll put something that basically means the same thing in its place or we'll, you know. So we needed to, to win the parliamentary battle. There was a media battle on top of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say that unless you only really read the, the worst of, of the newspapers, I think, I think, we, I think we did more than a, a decent shout at getting the, the positive case for change across. And I, I think it's quite telling that most of the media now wouldn't dream of printing the kind of stuff that even the broadsheets were printing at the time. On top of that, we had a, a legal process because... Um, there was an attempt to fund a, a challenge against Glasgow City Council for funding all of our organisations, um, right. the community organisations like the, the youth group that got a tiny amount of funding by that point, uh, the community centre that we met in. About 10 or a dozen organisations were involved in. The council was being sued for effectively for breaching Section 2A uh, by funding us. And so they had to freeze the funding pending that judicial review. So we had a funding crisis for these organisations and we had a, a court case, the judicial review coming up that we had to prepare for. So it was multi-layered, this, this kind of very, very intense eight, nine, ten months thereabouts. And we beat the bastards. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we got the legislation repealed. Like I said, there was you know, more balance, at least, in the, the media coverage by the end of it than there was at the start of it. All the organisations survived the funding crisis and the, the, the court case against the city council failed so yeah i came out of that thinking i could do more of this you know and in the middle of it i'd found myself sitting on the on the front bench of the scottish parliament uh giving evidence as a committee witness this was back before the current parliament building is uh, was complete it was still a highly controversial hole in the ground at that point <laughs> and so the the parliament itself met in the the church of scotland uh, assembly hall at the top of the royal mile and some of the other buildings around there and they didn't have enough committee rooms, so sometimes the committees would meet in the chamber. So 
when I was there giving evidence on behalf of the youth group as a committee witness. I was doing it in the in the chamber of, of this new Scottish Parliament. And mm. that was kind of an amazing experience, you know. And you know, Robin Harper, who's the, the only Green MSP at that time, he'd been very supportive. And so, you know, that kind of early influence from my mum about green politics, his support for the campaign and my feeling about, okay, this this new Scottish Parliament, it can actually do things that are powerful for my community and do it in an open way so that you know, if, if that if that decision had been made at Westminster, there's no way that we'd have had that level of access and that level of ability to could be inside the building in a in what felt like a participative process. And I think that was, you know, if you remember back just a few years before that, when when the the idea of a Scottish Parliament was still, you know, something in the future. This was what what was this going to be like? There was a lot. There was a there was a, a strong part of the expectation around the people who campaigned for a Scottish Parliament that it should share power with the people, uh, and that was one of the reasons it was a, a single chamber instead of having a second revising chamber, where you share power between the two chambers. The idea was that the Parliament shares power with the people. Mm. Now I don't think we've always got that right. I think we can do a lot better at it, but that was part of what the expectation was. And in that first session, the fact that this very, very difficult, controversial debate was, was going through and the doors were open to us to be in amongst that decision, it felt like that was that was the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. Uh, so that that left me feeling that, that I should get more involved. And I, I joined the Greens before the end of that campaign and um, just so happened that the next election was was a good one for us. So you've risen through the ranks of the Green Party and to present day where you are the co-leader yeah. of the Green Party with Lorna. That's right. And you are now in coalition government with the SNP. Yeah, I mean, we, we call it a cooperation agreement. Uh, there's a, a, an agreement called the with kind of fancy title is the Butte House Agreement, because that's where it was signed. And it, technically, a, a coalition should cover absolutely everything. And you've got complete collective responsibility across all policy areas. And we recognised, both ourselves and the SNP, that that was unlikely to happen. There were some policy areas where we were just never going to reach agreement. But that that shouldn't stop us focusing on the common ground, focusing on the stuff where we can push each other a little bit, where we can move beyond our comfort zones but where we can also achieve more by working together on the common areas. So yeah, we have a, a, a policy programme that is explicitly shared, and we've got a process for working out our differences where we don't yet have a shared position. And we've got a set of issues that have been formally excluded from the agreement, okay. so the Greens will vote against the government on those issues. And yeah, that seems to be working, I think. And I, I genuinely think most people can get the idea that two parties can disagree on some things and agree on others and decide to focus on what they agree on without pretending that they've you know they've they've ignored the things that they disagree on you can you know you, you and I could do that you mm-hmm. know we could reach agreement on on some things and disagreement on others and still be able to work together yeah you know i yeah. think people should be able to expect that kind of politics mm. so what's kind of what's the dynamic like within a cooperative Mm -hmm. government what's the dynamic like i mean like anything else like every workplace it depends on the people you know it's it's all about who's who's bringing the right attitude to their to their job and that that would be true even if it was a single party even if there was you know 65 green msps and we had a, a single party majority you know you would still have those those different attitudes and personality types and so on i think pretty much everyone who who goes into government after being in Parliament for a while will will tell you that the one thing that surprises them most is how slow everything is and how frustrating it is that you're constantly being told this is very complex minister, this will take a long time minister, this is very difficult minister and you want to crack on and, and do the stuff that you that you need to get done and you want to do it fast and there are problems for which there is no fast kind of quick fix. You You have to take your time over them or you will get them wrong. You know, I mentioned the decarbonizing buildings, for example. Uh, there's no magic wand for doing that. It's gonna take decades to do that. And so we need to set up a program that's going to, to work effectively over decades and work effectively across changes of government as well, because we can set that up. That doesn't mean we're gonna be in government for 20 odd years. Mm. It'd be foolish for anyone to assume that. So you need to, to think about that long-term stuff and, and how you can do things in, in a way that's going to 
keep on working long term rather than just be a, a kind of big bang that gets you some headlines but then fails. So mm. the, 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 the pace is, is, a, is a frustration and pretty much everybody who's, who's been in government will tell you that that's a frustration. Yeah. It's obviously been very challenging because of the financial circumstances. It's not just about austerity and we've had you know, years and years and years of, of constrained budgets from, from the UK because of austerity. It's impacting on public budgets just as like it's impacting on, on people's pockets when you see benefits not getting uprated, for example, or, or other, other attacks on, on vulnerable people. But then you've had this cost of living crisis, which is it's the cost of doing everything crisis. And so it erodes the actual value of the, of the government's budget. So even between setting a budget at the start of a financial year and starting to work through it, suddenly the money is worth less than it was when you yeah. set the budget. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is affecting every business, it's affecting every voluntary organisation, it's affecting councils, it's affecting government as well. So that, that's a huge challenge and trying to achieve the, the ambitious agenda that we know the country needs at the same time as you've got effectively less money in the bank to do it. That's very, very difficult and it forces you to make choices that you wouldn't want to make. Tackling the, the problems of, of long-standing poverty and inequality, tackling the climate emergency, trying to develop and, and, and sustain high quality public services. Any one of these challenges would be a very, very difficult thing to do at the best of times. And these are not the best of times financially yeah. for government or for, for individuals and households and, and families and so on. So yeah, I, I'm not gonna pretend that it's it's easy, but it, it certainly, I was so bored of doing the easy thing in politics. The easy thing in politics is standing up and making speeches, demanding perfection. Mm. I, I can do that in my sleep. I've been doing that for a long time. Uh, it's, I, I, know, I know it sounds cynical to say so, but you know, mm. opposition, when it's constructive opposition, when it's, when it's engaging with the reality, it's hugely important. But sometimes opposition is, is just about making speeches, demanding perfection. Getting a no, sound bite. Yeah, and it's easy. And it can feel quite fun, actually, because you, you can feel like you're on your moral high horse and you're saying, why isn't the government doing this? Why haven't they fixed it quickly and easily? Why haven't they fixed the very difficult, complex problem quickly and easily? But it doesn't achieve anything other than making you and sometimes your supporters feel good about the speech. It doesn't actually change anything in the real world. If Greens are about anything in politics, it's about taking on the really difficult challenges. And certainly in terms of climate, we've done a lot of the easy stuff already. Whether it's decarbonising electricity supply, it was, it was a challenge, but it was a very manageable challenge. You know, Scotland's got huge amounts of renewable potential. You just start getting the kit in the ground, you know. Um, the changes that we need to start making if we're going to get back on track with the climate targets uh, and, and continue to meet them to, uh, out to 2030 and 2045, those are going to be much more politically difficult challenges. And you've seen the, the pushback that we've seen with, for example, the low emission zone uh, as we start to change the way we move about, as we start to change the way we heat our buildings, uh, as we start to think about who's going to pay for these changes, because it's not all going to come from the, the public purse. Yeah. Not unless you want everybody paying vastly more tax, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, some of it's going to have to come from, from the private sector. And quite rightly too, in my view, some you know, private sector organisations, for example, that have caused the problem, should be contributing to the solution. That's one of the reasons why the UK sabotaging the deposit return scheme is so unjust. Because at the moment, the recycling rates that we've got at the moment are because the public sector, you and I, all of us through our tax, are paying for local council recycling services. Can we do them better? Can we get more recycling, higher recycling rates through those? Probably we can do a bit better, yeah. Deposit return schemes are very, very effective at getting up to the kind of 90% rates. But actually, why should all of us as taxpayers be funding that when it's, it's the industry that creates the problem that should be paying for the solution? And the deposit return scheme is a way of saying, the industry that creates the problem, the polluter pays, they're the ones who have to invest in a system that will achieve those high recycling rates. And that's what we did. And then the UK government pulled the rug out from under it. Uh, so that's you know, one of the reasons why it's, it's going to be quite worrying in the, the years ahead, that it's going to be very easy to generate polarisation or hostility 
to the kind of changes that we need in our society and our economy if we're going to continue the journey toward a, a, a zero emission society. What's your proudest moment in politics? Oh, oh, that's a... Uh, okay, probably just because we've been talking about these issues, the one that occurs to me, the one that comes to mind is the, the equal marriage vote uh, when, we, when we took that through because, you know, there, there were obviously uh, people campaigning against marriage equality and trying to say that same-sex relationships are in some way uh, second class or less worthy or, you know, wrong in, in some way. It was pretty clear that that view was no longer the majority public opinion, but it was still quite a, a challenging debate to have and we not only passed that that bill with a, a very substantial support it's one of the, the highest levels of political support in parliamentary terms of any parliament in Europe I think at, at that point but we knew that it wouldn't have happened without huge numbers of campaigners around the country many of whom were in the gallery the chamber and um, you're not supposed to clap in the Scottish Parliament the presiding officer if, the, if people in the gallery start to applaud they, they normally get a wee taking off. Uh, there was no taking off that day. The people in the gallery stood, stood up and applauded, and the MSPs stood up and applauded back. Um, so it was just a real powerful movement of Parliament's at its best when it shares power with the people, with it's an open, participative, mutual process where it's not just about Parliament is a, is a bubble, you know, working in, its, in itself. Uh, and there was that moment of connection between the community the campaigners and the and the MSPs. So and what happened the next week? I would love to think it was cause and effect. What happened the next week was that Labour and the SNP, who had been at each other's throats uh, over issues around social security, blaming each other for the fact that there wasn't a solution to the bedroom tax, the very next week they got around the table, they worked it out, mm. and we got mitigation in the bedroom tax. So, mm. sorry, I'm, You're getting probably, a bit I'm probably overreacting to this, but no. I, would, I would love to think that that was an example of how when we do work together, when we do find common ground, when we do have that open, participative approach to, to progressive politics, it actually encourages us and enables us to do more of that and to find the common ground more. You know, we'll continue to criticise each other and, and disagree with each other on issues. That's absolutely fine. But that shouldn't stop us from finding the common ground where it does exist and doing more to address the, the changes that people need in their lives mm. by working on the common ground. It would have brought back some memories when pre being a politician and, and those emotions that you felt when you stood in the chamber mm. and, and it would have brought back those same emotions, seeing, yeah. the, seeing the public involved. and Very much so, yeah. yeah. It's very easy and quite often justified to be cynical about the political process mm. uh, it's flawed of course it's flawed it's made of human beings <laughs> but it is also capable of of rising to the occasion uh, if we if we all take part with with good intention with creativity and kindness and those are innate human characteristics you know mm. like we were saying earlier there are, there are bad aspects of human nature and we let them out too easily mm. There are amazing aspects of human nature as well, that creativity, that empathy. And if we consciously try to let those aspects of our nature out, to let that become the way we do politics, yeah, that's, that's when you get amazing, powerful change. You know, easy, easy to reflect, because uh, I wasn't part of that generation, but on the, the generation after the Second World War, where a country that was economically broken, physically, you know, bombed out, emotionally traumatised, you know, they'd, they'd got through that together and they decided they were going to rebuild together. Mm. And what they got was a, a national health service and a welfare state. Mm. And 20, 30 years of, of politics that was about, you know, looking after each other, the cradle to grave. And 20 or 30 years of society becoming more and more economically equal as a result of that, that consensus. So, yeah, politics is capable of that. And we need more of that. SNP are going through a difficult spell at the minute. You would assume that 
SNP supporters would maybe looking elsewhere, you would also assume that the Greens and possibly Alaba would pick up some of those votes. Are you hoping to pick up some of those votes? Well, I mean, you, I think that's consistent with what you're seeing in some of the opinion polls recently. Uh, it's probably consistent with what you saw a little bit in the, the local elections last year. That was, that was our best ever. We got some stunning results in the local elections last year, uh, not just in places where we were already strong, but getting our first councillors elected in a few, a few, quite a few places around the country. And some of the polls this year show that there's a bit of a dip for the SNP and a bit of an increase for the Greens. It's probably not unusual that, that a party that's been in government for a while starts to kind of get mid-term dips in their opinion polling. And yeah, I mean, Nicholas Sturgeon was was not just a first minister, but was uh, someone who gained that incredible level of, of trust and respect through her work during the pandemic. You know, probably that that effect was amplified a bit by the contrast with Westminster and this kind of bumbling, shambolic approach that you saw through the the pandemic there. But, you know, if you think about the SNP as a party, they've had a stable cohort of leaders for decades now. Yeah. You know, even though you had this, you know, horrible, ugly uh, falling out between Sturgeon and Salmond, at any one time, you know, that happened after he left as leader, at any one time, their leadership cohort was a stable group. That's changed now, and, and a lot of that generation have has stepped back. So notwithstanding any of the other stuff that's going on, that, that's obviously stressful for them, but it's it's for them to deal with, and I'm, I'm not going to get into it. Even if it wasn't for, for those kind of side events, the, the, the challenge for a new First Minister, for Hamza Yusuf as the new First Minister, is not just to, to continue to run a, a, a government and deliver the programme, but to, to begin to build that, a similar kind of sense of, of trust with a leadership team around him uh, and to think of that, about that as something long term. So that's, that's, a, that's a big task for anyone. Um, and to do that after such turbulent change, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a big ask. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. Let's get political, political. Let's get political, political. Right, Keith has asked, heavily protected marine areas. Question number one, for people that don't know what are HPMAs and what will be the impact of HPMAs on our fishing communities? Marine protection, trying to you know, not just have, think about this in terms of, of restrictions about what you can't do, but of allowing nature to recover. That is the only path toward abundance. And if, if, you, if you want fishing communities, if you want any community who's, whose livelihood is close, closely connected to nature, if you want those communities to thrive for the long term, we need to restore abundance or we need to let nature restore itself to, to restore natural abundance. It's, it's hard to, to explain just how nature depleted we are now, how much our natural world has suffered. That impacts on the viability of, of every aspect of human life, particularly in, in communities that are really closely connected to, uh, to the natural world, whether that's the, the marine natural world or, or onshore. So yeah, I, I think the, the thing that we need to achieve with this is trying to get kind of sense of communities feeling that this is something that they can choose to do that is in their interests and that they can define it and decide what's the right place, what's the right pace at which to make those kind of changes to allow nature to recover. If this ends up being something that just feels like a remote government is deciding at the stroke of a pen to impose this, then it will fail. It, it won't work if it's, if it's seen as that kind of top-down imposition. But that has been done in just one place in Scotland so far, Lamlash Bay at Arran, and that's the one place that you have this, this, uh, this level of, of kind of no-take zone or kind of highly protected marine area. There's the equivalent of this new, new term that we've got for it. And it's been beneficial. It's been beneficial not just for fishing communities, but for other businesses that use the marine environment as well. So we need to we need to try and move this back from the space that, frankly, some of the opponents of the policy are deliberately trying to present it as though it's a done deal. This is just being done to you. I've even seen fake maps drawn up on social media and circulated by some of the critics of this policy, saying here here's what they've decided to do. 
no such map is accurate because the, no decisions have been made about, about specific sites. So if you've seen a map like that that's, that's trying to scare you <laughs> about this news. policy, uh, yeah, it's, it's some, somebody's having to you know, pull one over on you. So yeah. the consultation that's taken place is about the principle. Uh, no specific sites have been proposed. But we, what we need to do is have that, that honest conversation, particularly with those communities most closely affected, about the status quo is a death knell for you. Because if we continue uh, to place this unbearable pressure on the natural world, where's your fishing community going to see its future once the last fish has been taken out of the sea? You know, we've seen this incredible collapse over the long term. That's been started to arrest. We've started to stabilise some fish stocks. But that's not what we need. What we need is real recovery. Of the the natural abundance of the of the world, and you know, I don't know if you, you saw the the most recent David Attenborough series, Wild Isles, that, that is about the the natural history of of this country. And it was quite refreshing because so much of what he does and has done for it throughout his career, you know, it, is about nature as though it's something exotic in far off places. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was this was showing the nature of of the the landscapes that we live in and the the marine environment around it. And he kept coming back to this phrase uh, about why this is such a critical moment. There is just enough nature left that it can recover if we give it the time and the space that it needs to do that. Uh, If we keep going as we're going much longer, that won't be true anymore. And if we do, uh, and if we allow a return to that abundance, that's not just good for nature. That's not just good for biodiversity and the the health of, of, of ecosystems and the stability of the planet. It's brilliant for the communities that are most closely dependent on on nature. I suppose it's trying to find the balance uh, or trying to show that this is an opportunity where communities will see this as being restrictive Mm -hmm. and having to find that balance. eh? Yeah, and it it can be a challenging conversation to have, for sure. Not going to pretend otherwise, but it's a necessary conversation to have. Uh, mm. So we need to we need to find ways to open up the space for that that conversation to happen. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. Ah. Let's get political, political. Let's get political, political. Ooh. Changing subjects, Brexit has been a disaster, isn't it? Predictably, yeah. Has it, yeah. been, has it been exactly how you envisaged it, or has it been... No, I, I mean, I genuinely, uh, in, in the run-up to it, I, th- I didn't think that the 2016 referendum was going to go that way. And even once it had happened, I genuinely thought some kind of compromise about staying in the single market and, and the customs union was clearly... The, the government would decide that it was clearly in the country's necessary interest, that it was going to be less chaotic that the opposition would expect that as a bare minimum and that you would end up with, with something like that. And to see the most destructive, the most chaotic, uh, the most harmful, socially as well as economically harmful version of, of Brexit pursued as this kind of ideological obsession, uh, yeah, it's it's extraordinary. And you've, you've now got a Tory party that is, is deeply factionally riven between different you know, you, the, the 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 idea of, of what used to be the kind of, I might have disagreed with them, but the moderate centre-right, that basically doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. You know, got the Liberal Democrats, I guess. But, you know, the, the Conservative Party has uh, an explicitly far-right faction that is trying to form. Uh, you've got a kind of bombastic populist faction around Boris Johnson. Uh, you've got this kind of economically libertarian uh, uh, version, which might have been the... The inception for, for, for Brexit, but doesn't own it as a project anymore. Mm. Which which of those is going to win the battle for the soul of the Tory party in its in its current turmoil? I've no idea. Any of those answers is bad. Yeah, the fact that you've you've now got both the main opposition parties down south, the Labour and, and the Liberal Democrats, you know, effectively saying no, we're not going to reverse Brexit, even though the public opinion polling, including in places that voted Leave, is showing that. Most people think it was a mistake. You add in the, the scale of the, the anti-migrant political violence that's being inflicted at the moment. Ugh. I'm not going to try, start trying to list it all because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be here a long time. But yeah, yeah I, I hope that the UK's politics comes to some kind of uh, sense uh, at some point. I don't see it happening in the near term. And so it's one more reason why I think Scotland would be in a better place if we if we took control of some of these decisions for ourselves. 
you were saying there about the factions within the Conservative Party, and I was reading this morning that there's been an application for a new party down south called the National Conservatism Party. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised. Uh, I mean, it, it's yet to be clear if any serious players within the Tory party are going to jump ship and, and form a, a new organisation, but the National Conservative, was it National Conservatism Conference, Conference that, yeah. that happened a wee while ago, you know, even a couple of years ago, because that, that conference had been going for years. Yeah. Even until a, a year or two ago, the Tory party were disciplining uh, MPs who attended mm. and spoke at that, that conference. Now, complete change of, of approach, and they've got cabinet ministers uh, speaking at what is explicitly a far-right gathering. You, know, you, see, you see the way some of this kind of stuff is, is going to go if you look at American politics at the moment. Yeah, there's always been the sense that Britain or the UK looks at American politics and thinks, my God, that's that's pretty extreme, that's pretty awful. And then 10 years later, yeah. that's where we're at. There's a real worry that, that they're going to succeed in, in skewing and distorting the politics of this country in an even more far-right direction than has happened already. Seven years on the Brexit, mm-hmm. what have been the benefits to Scotland? But the first thing that springs to mind was the vaccine. So that's dead in the wood. Yeah, I have difficulty with it. So that's dead in the wood. Yeah, I have difficulty with it. So that's dead in the wood. Yeah, I have difficulty with it. So that's dead in the wood. Yeah, I have difficulty with it. So that's dead in the wood. Can we talk about gender recognition, Bill? Mm -hmm. Controversial and met some resistance. What's your thoughts on just looking back on it in the past couple of months? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm probably going to go back a, a bit further than that, but you know, it, it's very similar to the issues that I was just talking about, where you have some pretty toxic forces that are trying to create a sort of culture war yeah. uh, around demonising uh, a minority group. Some people, uh, and I would include some of the Conservative Party in this, seem emotionally incapable of seeing a minority or a marginalised or a vulnerable group and thinking, maybe people will vote for me if I punch down against them. Mm. You know, trying to create this sort of them and us uh, mentality and, and just being nasty to a, a marginalised group in order to curry favour. I mean, it's cl- kind of classic bully behaviour. If I go back to 2016, to the, the, the Scottish Parliament election in 2016, there was a, an all-party uh, debate that was hosted by uh, LGBT Youth Scotland, the Equality Network, Stonewall Scotland, a kind of collection of, of community organisations that that brought this this thing together and all parties sent a leadership figure so nobody was taking this as a trivial thing so there was myself uh, there was Kez Dugdale there was Nicola Sturgeon uh, Ruth Davison and Willie Rennie on this this panel and my jaw was kind of on the floor through it because you had this complete consensus across all five of these parties about some of the things that need to be done in the next session of the Scottish Parliament I'd never heard that before uh, you had a complete consensus on gender recognition reform Uh, because that was going in most of the manifestos, Uh, not just on the fact that it should happen, but on the detail of what it it should involve. Mm. Uh, And in fact, going further than than the Scottish government managed to put into the the legislation to to include legal recognition for non-binary people as well. And I was thinking, wow, have we we really, have we actually reached that point now where, you know, this is is, is accepted and across the board as saying that racism is wrong or that, you know, we need to tackle sectarianism, that progress for, for our community's equality is, is just everywhere now. And then I don't think you had to go forward more than about six months to start seeing the, the backlash against it and the, the way that transphobia was starting to be weaponised within some political parties, both SNP and Labour, started to get internal uh, issues there that, that I don't think they gave strong enough leadership in, in challenging. Yeah, you now have this, this much more vocal, toxic, uh, anti-trans kind of campaign that's that's grown arms and legs. It's genuinely scary to, to witness, and so much of it is so familiar. It's the tropes and stereotypes and prejudices and, and slogans and what have you that, that I do remember being directed at gay men in particular back in the 80s and the 90s, and just being repackaged and redirected at an even smaller, more marginalised minority group uh, in transgender people. If we if we allow this kind of toxicity to uh, to have political success, 
they won't rest on their laurels there. They'll they'll pick their next targets mm. and they'll they'll come after. Uh, maybe it'll be you next. Maybe it'll be your neighbour next. Maybe it'll be somebody in your workplace. And the the thing is, and this is this is why some of the the, the far right in America, the religious far right in America, cottoned onto this phrase, split the T from the LGB. This was why it was a strategically important objective for them. They know, and we should know, that marginalised people are stronger when we stand up for each other, when we got each other's back. Solidarity is a powerful concept. Mm. They know that they needed to split marginalised people against one another and have uh, an attempt to try and get uh, that, that solidarity to be broken down because they know that the, the movement for equality and human rights collectively is too powerful to beat when we're united. And that's why they want to fragment us. Because in order to defeat everybody's equality and human rights, in order to retreat to the, the kind of patriarchal, uh, class-based, white supremacist society that America was in the middle of the last century and is still struggling with those issues, they know that they need to defeat that sense of social solidarity between marginalized groups. Mm. Now, that's why a lot of this is coming from the US and from the US religious right, but it's, it's, it's playing out here as well in a similar way. And we, we absolutely need to stand together and to, you know, to have each other's back. One of the, the concerns about the gender recognition was some felt it was an attack on women's rights, in particular shared spaces. How would you implement the gender recognition bill and protect women's rights at the same time? Well, the vast majority of Scotland's women's and feminist movement didn't have those concerns. Uh, you know, organisations from Engender to Rape Crisis Scotland to Scottish Women's Aid to Women 5050, you know, Close the Gap, all of these organisations had worked through these issues already because they're the experts in the, in the subject. They've delivered these services. They've worked on the policy detail for many, many years, both through the, the creation of the first Gender Recognition Act and then through continuing to work together with LGBT organisations and transgender people's organisations. And they'd already looked at this and, and worked through it and, and not said that there are no issues, but here are what the issues actually are and here's how we deal with them. And then along came you know, a small number of, of, kind of pop-up organisations whose sole objective was to, to attack transgender people's rights. And yeah, it, it, it has no impact on, on spaces, whether that's changing rooms, toilets, or anything else. When's the last time you had to show your birth certificate to go for a pee? I mean, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And nor should it, because as I said earlier, if you if you start requiring a kind of papers please mentality to accessing spaces like that, the the vast majority of the people who, who are going to suffer because of that are not transgender people. They're people who, who are not trans, but who, for whatever reason, their choice or, or you know aspects about stereotypes about how bodies look, uh, they they don't fit a stereotype or an expectation or a social kind of standard about. Uh, what men and women look like um, and they're the ones who vastly outnumber transgender people because transgender people are, are a very very small group and that's where a lot of the, the harassment ends up is uh, is against people who, who are not trans but they're just going about living their lives and you know so much of this is is geared toward trying to make people afraid trying to make people afraid of each other uh, and so much, it reminded me of nothing more than, uh, you remember the period when Tommy Robinson, the, the fascist activist down south, used to hang about outside courtrooms where Muslim men were on trial right. uh, for committing very serious offences. He wasn't at all interested in those offences. If he had been, he'd have respected the fact that the legal process has to, has to continue and that, that trials have to be fair and have to, uh, have to be allowed to, 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 to proceed. No, he, what he was interested in was finding some Muslim men who were accused of doing horrible, appalling things and pointing at them and saying, that's what Muslims are like. That's why you should be afraid of Muslims. And the way in which uh, examples uh, have been used to try and demonise and stigmatise transgender people uh, and to make people think that they're a threat or they're, they're in some way uh, dangerous people to be around, it's exactly the same tactic. 
it's exactly the same tactic being uh, carried out for exactly the same purpose mm. to demonize to stigmatize and to make people afraid of their neighbors this is a difficult a, a really really difficult question you've mentioned that a couple of times scotland being a progressive nation can you be too progressive too quickly i'm not quite sure what that means i mean certainly you can you can have times when politicians need to give leadership and to advocate for change and to do that in a way that challenges public opinion. I think it's more often the case that public opinion is ahead of politicians, and politicians can be where some of the the kind of small c conservatism comes from. And sometimes it's the politicians who need to be challenged. You know, thinking back to that that Scotland of the of the eighties, where a lot of politicians felt that bishops wielded block votes. You know, that's one of the reasons gay men were criminalised for longer in Scotland than in the rest of the UK because politicians, for whatever reason, thought that the, the public wouldn't accept it because there were hierarchy figures that wouldn't accept it. But I think, uh, you know, I think one of the one of the things that's that's happened in in terms of equality is that uh, over the years it's it's sometimes been politicians who are being too cautious and that the public is is ready to challenge politicians to go further. You know, obviously the, there are times when you might get the balance wrong and create a backlash. That can happen, does happen. But I think, I think that's far more likely to happen when politicians are acting out of bad faith and deliberately trying to be divisive and polarising mm-hmm. and, and being opportunistic. As an SNP supporter mm-hmm. myself and what's been happening recently within the SNP, and I think as well in Scotland, I think we almost took a high ground of the corruption that happens down south doesn't mm-hmm. happen up here with the elections coming up how do you convince an SNP supporter Indy supporter to vote green at the next election one of the critical things for us during 2014 was not to try and pretend that independence was an end in itself mm-hmm. that it's a means to an end it's a way of achieving a particular vision of of Scotland's future We think it's the only vision of Scotland's future because we think sustainability is the only future that the world has. Mm -hmm. If the independence campaign uh, had been, as the Brexit campaign was, founded on three simple words, take back control, and it had had nothing more than that, I wouldn't have been willing to take part. I I wouldn't have taken part in a campaign as dishonest as that. Take back control. It means nothing. And so that Brexit campaign, by meaning nothing, it allowed itself to pretend that it meant everything. All different visions of of what Brexit meant were were on offer. And clearly that could not be true. That That was why it was fundamentally dishonest. So from my point of view, the independence case has to be specific. It has to be about saying, here's the future that we believe in. Here's the specific vision for Scotland's future that we believe in and that we believe we can make happen. I think inevitably that means saying oil and gas is not our future, renewables are our future. It means saying uh, that the inequality that comes from deregulated market extremism is not our future. Social solidarity and and a more equal society, that is our future. it, it means the challenges of the 20th century, whatever you thought of the, 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 the way that the 20th century's politics played out, that's for the history books now. We need to be looking at the 21st century and beyond uh, and, and thinking about how Scotland as an independent country can play a, a positive role in the world and for a, a better and a sustainable world. So for me, independence as an idea doesn't exist in the abstract. It's, in, it's, it's only meaningful if it's inseparable from uh, a, a vision about the, the kind of Scotland we want to live in. And so for a Green, it's about painting that picture. For, for Green politics, it's about painting that picture and making it relevant and, and, and real in terms of people's lives. So that's why I think our voice managed to become distinctive in 2014. Uh, and it's it's why we'll continue to, uh, to 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 paint that picture as well as we can, uh, and if we if we achieve independence in a short, medium, or long term, I don't know. I th- I think we will achieve it. I think it makes sense for Scotland, and that's why Scotland ultimately will choose it. I th- I think one of the deep frustrations that many many people have at the moment is that, in the absence of a clear process, it still feels very abstract to people. Uh, you know, one of the things that was so empowering in 2014 was because this decision was literally in your hands, 
you know, we were all participating in that shared decision about the future of our country, it made it real. And it got far more people engaged in debates uh, about the kind of society they want to live in. Yeah. Not just independence, yes or no, but what kind of place do we want Scotland to be? Mm-hmm. We need to find ways to recapture that kind of energy, even while the UK is, is kind of bluffly saying, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. You know, I, I genuinely think if I was in the least bit motivated to make a case for the union, I could make a better case for it than they're bothering. <laughs> because they're, they're not even trying. They're not All trying. they're saying is, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. Yeah. You know, we, we answer that with, yes, we will, mm. but we also answer it with a, a, a vision about what kind of country we believe Scotland can be uh, and, and start to show why having the, those, dis, the, those abilities to make decisions, whether that's about how we treat migrants, whether it's about how we regulate our electricity system, whether it's about our relationship with our European neighbours, all of that is about relating that to real people's lives and, and why making those decisions in a different way will make our country a better place. I heard that you were a sci-fi guy. Oh yes, yeah, always have been, yeah. Star Wars? Um, The first series of Andor was a astonishing to me I, it wasn't just the best star wars that i'd seen but the best sci-fi that i'd seen for, for quite really? a long time doctor who is is closest to doctor, my heart you're doctor who yeah, man <laughs> I, I i mean i don't mind some of the new stuff but it's it's the old stuff from right. even from before i was growing up that, that i've got the the softest spot for yeah like a bit of trek uh there's some there's some really interesting more obscure sci-fi out there as well if you if you go looking for it um there was one uh called station 11 uh, I thought it was a response to the pandemic because you watch it and it feels like it's uh, a response to that, that sense of cataclysm about how a pandemic would destroy everything. Uh, it was actually written several years before that and they'd started filming it just before COVID hit. Really? So they, they'd begun the production and then they, it was delayed because of the... But yeah, it, it, it follows the, these time periods within a, a young woman's life from when she's a little girl just before the event that... Yeah. <laughs> that changes everything. Uh, a little bit later as she's surviving the collapse of civilization, and then much later on as she's in a post-civilization, new civilization emerging kind of, and it's almost like this meditation on memory. You're never quite sure how much of, of the story you're being told is actually what happened in our life, or how much of it's the, the, the young woman remembering the little girl, or misremembering, or misinterpreting what happened. Beautifully shot, and it was also really rare because there were there were characters in it who did really bad things, but none of them were kind of stereotypical two dimensional bad people. Right. Once you understood the the context of their story and who they were, all of their behaviour was was understandable. So yeah, Station Eleven would Station be my Eleven. top recommendation um, in in recent years. Where would you where would you find that on Netflix or something? Would you? Might have been on the bad internet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> That's to get edited out. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you watched every Disney Star Wars production? No, I mean, I um, I wasn't a big fan of The Mandalorian, I have to say. Really? Yeah. Um, I watched the first season and kind of vaguely enjoyed it. And, and after that, it kind of felt like it became very formulaic where, you know, uh, you know arrive in town, yeah. destroy some megafauna, uh, yeah. And then and then do a kind of like a kind of A team type storyline yeah. with the, the local community or whatever. And um, but yeah, the the thing I loved about Andor was that it it very clearly felt like it was in the Star Wars universe design and the the, the kind of just the con the context of it all. Uh, the production design was was excellent, but none of it was about what a friend of mine described as space wizards. Right? Yeah, none of it was about the Force. Or the kind of the, the kind of fairy tale storyline that, that the original films are about. Mm. It's about power. It's about authoritarianism, and it's about revolution. And you know, if if you're seeing a, a, a civilization as evil as as the Empire was, that's the story you want to you yeah. want to see. You know, the, the the lightsabers and the and the speed bikes and stuff was all great fun, but revolution's about politics. It's yeah. about it's about power. It's about. Descent. Yeah. And, yeah. It was great. Andor was brilliant. 
I want to thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's been a, a, a wide-ranging conversation and yeah. uh, I've enjoyed it very much. Thanks very much. Yeah.